Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Visit audible.com slash twist for your free audiobook. And by Amazon Web Services. Get the resources you need to easily get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups, including AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and special offers from third parties. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. This is a very special episode because it's about me. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Did I really just say that? That's crazy. Anyway, listen, every once in a while, somebody says, hey, Jason, I want to turn the tables on you. I know you're a great interviewer. I know you have these great people on your show and you ask such great questions. I want to do that to you. And I always say, no, no, thanks. I'm too busy. And who the hell wants to hear about me when I can have all these great guests on the program? But once in a while, someone like Rafe Needleman asks, and he's a good friend, right? He's always on the program for the News Roundtable and he's at Evernote running their accelerator. And I have no choice but to say yes because he's my friend. So I said, yes, Rafe, of course you can interview me for your accelerator and we'll talk to these different startup companies. And uh, we did that and uh, here it is. It's an interview of me at Jason Calacanis uh, at the Evernote headquarter in Redwood City. Thanks a lot, Rafe, for having me. I hope you enjoy this and I hope I say something smart. You guys will tell me at Jason on Twitter. Bye. That's what it's all about, man. They said, funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. <clears throat> I am Rafe Needleman. I, am, uh, I work here at Evernote. Uh, I'm happy to uh, talk tonight with uh, Jason Calacanis of uh, several ventures, which we'll get to in just a second. Um, before I introduce him though, uh, so I'm here at Evernote after a, a fairly lengthy career in journalism working with the Evernote Accelerator, which is our new venture to get um, companies, the the best companies that are building applications on top of the Evernote platform here to work with us to extend their business, extend their product, um, to make Evernote uh, more useful for more people. The more happy users we have, the better Evernote does, the better our developers do. It's a very virtuous cycle. So if you're in the Evernote Accelerator, please raise your hand. There's some really cool companies here. We've got a, a product that you can blog from Evernote uh, directly to the blog with no intermediate step. It's very cool. We've got some very cool travel apps, uh, some augmented intelligence apps, app, um, and just some really, really cool stuff here. So uh, check out the accelerator companies. They're, they're really awesome. I also want to mention that if you uh, are looking for a gig at Evernote, Brittany is here, and she will talk to you happily. That's Brittany back there. All right. Um, so. Part of the one of the things we're doing at the accelerator here is every week for the four-week accelerator, we're having a great speaker to come out uh, and talk with us. And tonight, that speaker is Jason Calacanis. Jason and I have. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, mom. (laughs) Jason and I have known each other since uh, the first dot-com bubble in uh, '98, '99, uh, when we were at competing publications. He actually started his own. I was just. uh, writing a little column for Red Herring called Catch of the Day, and Jason was running the Silicon Alley Reporter. Um, as the internet evolved, he went on to launch um, the first uh, major blog network, Weblogs Inc., which ran in Gadget, Autoblog, Joystick, and other great blogs like that, which are all still cooking. Uh, he is running the unbelievably great launch festival and hackathon, which you've got a hackathon coming up uh, November 8th. Yeah, November yeah. 8th uh, in, at the Metreon. So there's a really and cool space cool. Awesome. on the top floor of the Metreon. We'll have 1,000-plus uh, developers there and 250 teams. And the exciting part about it is I'll be investing from my angel fund, the launch fund, $50,000 in each of the two winners. Oh, wow. Um, and then if those winners want and they do a great job you know, incorporating and doing all that, I'm going to put them on the AngelList syndicate program. They have to do a little bit of work to get on there because it's pretty serious business. Mm -hmm. Um, But if that happens, that could be another 
$800,000 investment. Wow, awesome. Good work. I, I always thought you were a true believer when it came to startups. I, like I, I, am, a, I am a true believer, yes. Yeah. I, I've uh, seen the story too many times yeah. actually happen, right? Like, so yeah. when you see s founders and entrepreneurs change the world over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for 20 years, and you get lucky once or twice yourself and, you yeah. know, put a dent in the universe, you become a believer. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that seven out of 10 times it is not end in tears, you know, so. I haven't finished inter inter introducing you yet. Okay, go ahead. So, <laughs> so Jason also has a, a great um, uh, uh, po pod video podcast called This Week in Startups, um, and he runs an awesome uh, email list called The Launch Ticker. Um, which is just, it's all the smart stuff that's happening on the internet right now. So before we get into it, I just want us all to welcome Jason and thank him for coming. And I just want to say I love Evernote and I've been a user since like, you know, year one. And uh, I think it's just an absolutely fantastic product across many platforms. I've used it on BlackBerry, Windows, um, Mac OS, everything except for Chrome OS. All right, Is so anybody I'll working on the Chrome OS? Pixel? No? You guys got to get on that. Well, I, so I'm supposed to ask the you then. The 15th platform. <laughs> I'm supposed to ask you then because it's our, Phil tells us when we yeah. find an Evernote fan, the, the thing we're supposed to ask, and this is something that you might want to do if you're running your own startup as well, what can we make better? Hmm, that's a good question. You, you can hit me with that later. Okay, I'm going to think about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, you have started a lot of companies. How many, and why do you keep doing it? Um, I've arguably started one, two, um, three, maybe four companies. Yeah. And um, I think the reason I do it is I love the act of creating something from nothing. I love taking something from an idea and conceiving it into a product with a team of people I respect and enjoy working with, and then giving it to the public and having them say, wow, that's, that's awesome, right? Like, to me, on a professional basis, and even on a personal basis, it's one of the coolest things in the world for me is when that new product launches, um, you know, people embracing it, or when I come to an event like this and Literally, you know, 10 people come up and say, I am such a fan of This Week in Startups. I watch every episode. I've been watching for three years. I've been watching for one year. Or people stop me or follow me into bathrooms frequently. Like, oh, I'm sorry. It's, you know, like, it also gets a little weird. Yeah, like, I have people That was like, one of my pro PR tips, by the way. You know, this is not a place of business. I, I always uh, have a rule with everybody now, and I say it on the show for people who listen, which is don't be weird. Because, like, you know, just normal guy just happened to have a podcast. And... <laughs> you know, one time I was in a restaurant with my wife and we're having like a conversation for an hour over dinner that a wife and a husband might have. And like literally, you know, while we're paying the check, the guy at like, you know, one of those close tables next to you leans over and he's like, I'm a huge fan of This Week in Startups. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my God, what was my wife yelling at me about? Or what am I, you know, like what were we talking about for the last hour? So I always just tell people, come up, or if you see me in the street, just yell at me. The favorite guest you've ever had. It's perfect icebreaker. Just be like, Sokka! Or I yeah. love Kevin Rose. Or I like when Rafe was on the program. Whatever it is, just do that. But, you know, back to your original question. The act of creation is just such a wonderful thing, putting something into the universe. It separates you from 99 out of 100 people in the world who dream of putting something into the universe, but who never take their shot. And, you know, I, I grew up in kind of humble beginnings in Brooklyn. My dad a bartender. My mom a nurse. And... You know, the idea that a person could be more than a cop or a nurse or a bartender to me was kind of fantastical, to be honest. Like my, you know, uh, brother and I took the police test together, the New York City police, and he went in and I went to college. And uh, then I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to really make something of myself and I'm going to join the FBI. And I'm going to go to John Jay Criminal Justice, you know, City College for my master's in criminology. And then this thing, the internet happened while I was in college, hmm. you know, and I, I kind of really was fascinated by CD-ROMs and multimedia and Prodigy and CompuServe and bulletin board systems. But I was originally thinking I was going to go into be an FBI profiler. And the fact that I was able to start companies, once that started happening to me, I was like, wow, you don't have to stay poor and have to work for somebody else 
and live month to month. To me, that was an incredible concept in and of itself. Mm. And even the fact that, you know, you could wind up being in the newspaper for a reason other than <laughs> catching a ball at Yankee Stadium, which is like, you know, like somebody was like, hey, you know, Joe's in the newspaper. And I'd be like, really? And they're like, yeah, look, and here's the back of the post. And you see that, like, two to the left, right behind there is, yeah. there, there's Joe. And he'd be like squinting, oh, wow, Joe's in the paper. You know, but, and then one day after I started looking on a reporter, they put me on the cover of the New York Times business section. You know, my mom calls crying, like, you're on the cover of the New York Times. And truth be told, I'm 25 years old, and I knew the story was coming out. It was written by Lisa Napoli, who you probably know. And I got up at 3 in the morning, and I started walking around Manhattan trying to find the New York Times. This is before they, would, they, wouldn't, put the paper, they wouldn't put the story online mm. until the next day. So I was literally walking from bodega to bodega trying to find the New York Times. And I get to a bodega, and he's got them tied up. And I'm like pleading with the guy, can you please open it? I got to get the New York Times. He's like, no, I don't have time right now. I'm like, listen, I really need it. I'm in there. The guy's like, fine. He cuts, and I'm like, look, I'm in it. And the guy's like, get the fuck out of here. Like, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> um, but to me, you know, like that was super exciting and motivating in the early days. But then as you get older, and you've done it a couple times, there's a different, more soulful, I think, reason, you know, that you find a motivation to be an entrepreneur. You know, and for me, it really is about the team, building teams and building brands. Like I almost feel like my life's work now is more about building the team members and helping enabling them to build the brand, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see that with the Evernote brand behind us. Like it's not Phil anymore, right? It hasn't been Phil for a long time and he would freely admit that. You can't be on 15 platforms, you can't innovate, you can't scale to the level Evernote has or any of these great companies without just an awesome team, right? I can't mm -hmm. do even my podcast without you know the five, six, seven, eight people who work on it. And so, I think you get different motivation at different ages and being aware of motivation as an entrepreneur and the ability of those different motivations to keep you going is critical. Yeah. Being aware of your motivation. You know, I had a very competitive, you know, well, you knew me at that time, like very competitive. I'm going to prove it to the world that I can be somebody because I'm just a kid from Brooklyn who's got no business being here. And then something flips, you know, you sell a company, you do well, people recognize you at parties, and then it's like, well, what am I doing this for exactly? And I kind of had that moment happen to me, you know, after 9-11 and some other events, and, you know, I started realizing, like, I, I just love doing this. I just love the act of somebody using my product, somebody mm -hmm. saying they like it or having an opinion on it or being touched and impacted by it, and I just love that feeling of getting to the office, and I've hired somebody new, and they have a great first day, yeah. you know? Like, to me... That's the peak of entrepreneurship. Selling your company, yeah, it's great. No, no doubt. It quickly wears off. Huh. Raising the money, fantastic, quickly wears off. But being the guy or the gal who created Evernote or Engadget or Silicon Valley Reporter and having just somebody say, like, you know, I really enjoyed that. Hmm. That, to me, so, is the height of entrepreneurship. Ah, <clears throat> uh, yes, Audible. Audible, how I love you, Audible. I've loved you for many years. You know that. Mmm, Audible. They're the leading provider of audiobooks, and audiobooks make you smart. They entertain you, and they make you catch up on your cultural relevance. It's hard to read all these books that are out there. It's inconvenient to carry all these books with you, and it, it strains your eyes sometimes. Sometimes you just want to kick back and just listen. I love listening to audiobooks, especially when there's a great narrator, and Audible has some of the best narrators, and they and you know it's great because you can you can hear the narrators read different books. I've actually started to click on who the narrator is and look because I just like the sound of their voices at other books they've done. I know that's kind of weird, but I am an audiobook fanatic, and Audible is the gold standard. Uh, they have over 150,000 titles, and you can listen to them anywhere. You know that. Uh, you can get a 30-day free trial by going to audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist. Please tweet that for me um, and give your friends, email to them, a free 30-day trial and get a free book. You know what book I would like to get? I've been reading about the new Malcolm Gladwell book, uh, David and Goliath, Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. Hey, that sounds super relevant to what we all do. I'm going to add it to my cart. You see I have 21 credits available because I am a platinum member. Member. And I, uh, I I think you should do that too. And I just say next step, boom, uh, and uh, 28 bucks or one credit. And uh, oh, I got to have my password, boom. And then all of a sudden, it will be on my phone for the ride home. And what's incredible is, this is a great feature. I don't even have to read the copy for this because I know the product so well. Um, when you're on 4G or LTE and you're like, oh my God, I got to download the whole audio book. It's going to kill my data plan. No, 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 no. 
They'll just download the first three hours for you. They know. So a lot of times I'll be getting on a plane and like we're taxiing and they're like, you have to put your phone away. And I'm just like, I have to download three hours of Audible so I can get to San Francisco and listen to something good on the plane. That's an actual uh, audio clip of the uh, flight attendant and I arguing on the uh, Southwest flight. Anyway, listen, if you want to get an iPad mini signed by me, you can send your Audible confirmation to audible at launch.co. So go to audible.com slash twist, get David and Goliath by my pal Malcolm Gladwell, and then forward that email to audible at launch.co, and you're entered into the contest. Get the iPad mini signed by me. And let me tell you something. They've got a great iPad app, great iPhone app, great Android app. And when you got that iPad that lasts for 10 hours, and then you got your iPhone that lasts for seven or eight hours, I put the books on both, so I don't have to worry about it. If I ever run out of, uh, if I ever run out of uh, battery power, I'm, I'm still good any other device. Listen, it's a great service. I love it. I've always loved Audible. I always will love Audible. Thank you so much. Let's thank them on our Twitter handles. Thank you at Audible underscore C-O-M for making a great product. That makes all of us smarter. David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell. What a great pick. Audible.com slash twist. Let's get back to the program. Well, speaking of entrepreneurship now, you've been in the modern era of technology from pretty much from the start. If we, if we talk about the, the modern era starting with the rise of the consumer internet. Yeah, uh, or the PC. Okay. Yeah, uh, even the 80s. And the nature of, uh, of entrepreneurship, of starting a business, has changed, obviously, um, from the start. The, the amount of money it takes to launch a business has dramatically gone down. Um, we're at an interesting point right now where um, you can start a company with, and, and get a sizable customer base with very little input. Where is it going? How far does this curve go? It's a, it's a great question. Um, some would argue, and I might agree with them, that it's gotten too easy. You know, back in the day, and I don't mean to sound like an old dude, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, you know, you, you didn't even know who the angel investors were, and there were only 10 of them. The, the, you didn't know how to get a meeting with a VC, and you didn't know what a term sheet is. Now, if I ask people here how many people have seen a term sheet, how many people have negotiated a term sheet, how many people know what participating preferred is, and how many people know what a liquidation preferred is, everybody knows that information. It's all been disclosed in the last 10 years. But previously, that was all hidden. And if you were one entrepreneur talking to another, and I said, hey, would you mind showing me your term sheet? You know, you raised money. The entrepreneur would be like, I I'm sorry, I can't show it to you. I mean, that's literally how it was. You, you didn't know how to, you know, see that term sheet until you've got your first one. And so, you know, now, <laughs> obviously, everybody knows it costs a magnitude less. Back in the web 1.0 days, you're talking about $5, $10 million to get a product to market. Now you're talking about five, ten thousand dollars fifty thousand a hundred thousand dollars five hundred thousand dollars to a million dollars, depending on the complexity of the product, to get it to market. That's a magnitude change. Whether it's a tenth, a hundredth, or a thousand, it's a huge change. And for different companies, it would be different amounts. Now, there are some things that have not changed. And, you know, obviously not having to pay Oracle a million dollars to get your database, not having to pay Sun, you know, half a million dollars, and Verizon a hundred thousand dollars, all those like people you had to pay, that's all gone away. But the things that haven't changed is you need to be able to have a great idea, you need to be able to execute on that idea. You need to be able to build a team. You need to be able to motivate a team. And you have to be able to not give up when you get smacked in the back of the head with a brick over and over and over and over again. And there's a real mythology, a dangerous mythology, um, that sort of hit the startup scene in this wave, especially because of accelerators, I think. And it's something great to talk about since you have one, which is that this is supposed to be easy. And you know what? It's getting easier and easier, right? Like you can get into an accelerator. You get the ramen money. You, you know, it's, everybody's telling you how to do it. You got a million people giving you advice. But when you get out into the real world, you're, there's still going to be sharks out there. there it's still going to be you know, stormy. And I feel like a lot of the entrepreneurs are really weak. You think we're coddling entrepreneurs? I think there's a combination of coddling going on and a delusion delusional nature to it that it's all high fives and I think some people who maybe didn't have the resiliency to be entrepreneurs have now selected themselves as entrepreneurs mm. now I'm not going to be sit here and be like oh well there's only a few anointed people that get to be entrepreneurs I believe a large group of people could become entrepreneurs but if you come into it thinking like it's going to be high fives and 
you know, uh, Marissa, you know, calling to buy your company is the worst case scenario, like, or, you know, you're picking between Y Combinator, Evernote, and Techstars. That's actually, this is like a peak moment. It's not always going to be this easy. And when you certainly get out into the real world, you are going to get your ass kicked day in and day out. If I were to, how many people in the room are entrepreneurs or at a startup? Raise your hand nice and high if you're an entrepreneur or at a startup. So it's like half the, half the people here. Now, of that half, how many people would say the last week has been easy? Raise your hand if the last week's been easy. <coughs> okay, nobody. Now, raise your hand if the last week has been really fucking hard. Raise your hand. Okay, almost everybody, right? And so that's what people are not prepared for. It's hard. And, you know, when I'm investing in companies now, I'm on the other side of the table, and I say the same thing to entrepreneurs. You know, listen, I'm going to give you 50 grand or 250 grand, and we're going to try to make a go of this. 70% chance you're going to fail statistically based on, you know, what I know. Um, and then there's a, you know, whatever it is, 25% chance we're going to just, you know, do okay and there's a you know, 5% and less chance we're going to have a really great return. And I'm totally okay with that, and you have to be okay with that. But what I need you to know is, like, we're going to do this two or three more times together. So if you fail, I just want to be the first call on the next company or the next one. And I'm looking for resiliency mm -hmm. because so many times I see people get through their accelerator. They get that, you know, free money at the end of the accelerator. All this free money comes at the Y Combinator or Techstars. It's like, oh, free money. Here's your, here's your note. Here's your $150,000 from the Russian guy. And everybody's like, wow, this is great. And then that runs out. <coughs> and then it's hard. And they give up. And, you know, that, that's not entrepreneurship to me. I think there's got to be a lot more resiliency. And I find there's a lot of dilu um, sort of uh, dilution of talent Many teams, you know, where I see two or three Y Combinator or Techstars companies, and they, they, you know, like this one's got great marketing and branding, and this one's got some great core technology, and this one does great UX and design. And it's just like, God, can the eight of you people get together and make one product like Voltron instead of making like Voltron's arm? Like, let's really try to make something substantial here. And um, so it's never been easier to be an entrepreneur. It's never, there's money everywhere. If you can't raise money today, you really suck at what you do. Like, if you can't get into an accelerator, you really suck. Like, there's so many opportunities. And I don't mean that to make anybody feel bad, but you, you do need to be able to look in the mirror and say, like, if I can't raise money, this idea must really suck <laughs> because money is literally being thrown everywhere. You know, like, everybody look under your chair. There's probably a $50,000 check under there and a note. Like, I'm joking. Did you put it there? Yeah, exactly. Everybody yeah. gets an A round. Yeah, right. Woo! <laughs> Series A crunch is over. So, um... When we were talking about this uh, this evening before, you were talking about the era of unlimited capital and an audience of billions. And now that you're describing what it's like to be an entrepreneur these days in the current funding environment, that sounds actually more terrifying than uh, liberating because everybody's got to be chasing that same golden hook. It's a good, ring. Yeah, it's the, really what I tell people today is the limited quantity, the, the limited um, resource is attention. Mm. And so, you know, Evernote comes out with a great idea and there's 50 Evernote competitors and, you know, uh, there's amazing video, you know, Grand Theft Auto V comes out last week and like, okay, well, that's it for startups for two or three weeks because everybody's going to be doing that, you know, when some great movie comes out or it's The Walking Dead's back on TV. Like, there are so many things vying for consumers' attention right now that are at such a high quality level. And this is what I wrote about a couple of years ago in a piece called The Age of Excellence that you can Google later, where I think the world has figured out what great products are and bad products are in such a quick and savvy fashion. Consumers are so sophisticated. They know that Breaking Bad uh, is awesome and The Walking Dead's fantastic, except for season two, the first half. Like, and they process this shit, so, and people are laughing because they know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, okay, nothing happened on the farm for five episodes. Like, what the fuck's going on here? And that kind of processing of stuff, and like, you have to catch up on Breaking Bad, and, you know, it, it, it immediately comes out on Twitter, social networks, the internet, blogs. And so the world processes everything into two buckets. This is excellent. And this is garbage. And in the old days, it used to be like, well, there's like a six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. And hey, you know, Microsoft Word is not the best word processor. WordPerfect's actually a 10, and Microsoft Word's a seven or an eight. 
but with distribution they can win right and eventually they become the 10 right. and where perfect goes away like or you know this person has distribution and they can make their phone better than the other one today it's like either you build the best product everybody finds out about it and you win and you win a disproportionate reward like wildly <coughs> disproportionate or it doesn't work and you are flatlined right and this is a distinct difference you know, than any other moment in history I think of where the marketers and distribution really, they, they've gone away uh, to a certain extent, or to a large extent, and product excellence is what drives everything, right? Mm -hmm. And what that means is, it's actually kind of terrifying, that's the terrifying part to me for entrepreneurs is, you have to continually up your game. Like, I looked at the products I was making over the last couple of years, and I said, you know what? My design is not good enough. Like, everybody in the world just got, like, fantastic at design, and I haven't gotten fantastic. I'm just good. You know, fuck, I got to get better, you know? Like, and so I started really researching that. I bought 100 different books on Amazon about design. I started hanging out with designers. I started hanging out on Behance and just leveled myself up. And that's what's happening is, you know, these startups are getting better and better. The products are getting better and better. And you can see that from the competition in smartphones, where you know Samsung comes out with something that just dwarfs what Apple came out with, and Apple comes out with something that dwarfs what Samsung came out with, and the, the Nokia Lumia you know, has like that 25 megapixel camera with the Carl Zeiss lens, and it's an absolutely extraordinary product, and then you know, people don't really care, even though it's like an incredibly extraordinary product. Like, holy cow, like this is sick. And television shows, they just one-up each other and get better and better and better. And then cars, you know, the Tesla Model S comes out, and it's this extraordinary vehicle that wins the greatest car ever made by Consumer Reports, the greatest safety ever by this NTSB. It breaks one of the machines. It's so safe. Like, that's the level of ex excellence entrepreneurs are taking things or artists. And what that means is when the Fisca Karma comes out and it's got a little bit of style but a terrible amount of substance and it lights on fire and burns your garage down or it shuts off on the highway, that company dies. Like, it, oh yeah, it's a beautiful car, but it's not a great product, and this other product's great. Tesla goes to $20 billion in market cap. Fisca Karma goes to zero in the same three-year period, mm. right? We're just processing through. Palm goes to zero. Apple and Android go to the roof, right? Like, we're processing winners and losers very harsh and very fast. And so it just means you have to be at the top of your game, performing at an excellent level. When I meet with entrepreneurs in these angel investing settings and they're showing me my stuff, I'll just say to them, like, you want the red pill or the blue pill? You want me to sugarcoat it, make you feel good? You want me to tell the truth? And I've never had somebody say sugarcoat it, never. Uh, and I say, okay, listen, entrepreneur, entrepreneur, this design sucks. This is like a seven design or a six design, and you're up against nines and tens. You can't copy Pinterest and their idea and then have your design be shittier than Pinterest's. Like, if you're going to copy it, at least make it 20% better, right? Right. Like, how do you copy it and it's worse? <laughs> You know, like, so you're not even a good forger, is what you're telling me. And you want money and an investment? No. No, 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 no. So speaking of money. Did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah. You Sorry, did. I think very I ranted. Well. Very well. Very in, in, in great depth. That was, a, that was a nine or ten answer, no question. Um, so I, I, the, the Accelerator uh, guys that are here with us um, have been asking, uh, very curious about AngelList and the syndicates and how that is changing the nature of things. So I want that to be maybe the last um, financial question before we get on to some other product and company questions. But talk to us about how that's changing the game and how, what yeah, do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's another example of this massive disruption and product excellence. Um, does anybody remember Venture Hacks three or four years ago, how it all started? Raise your hand if you remember Venture Hacks. Not many people, but, you know, he, he started, Naval, by just putting up, like, here's term sheets and here, answering questions about the venture capital process. And then he's built that company to just be wildly innovative, and, and people hated him in the beginning. Not everybody, but a lot of people were like, in the, on Santo Road, were like, that's stupid, or like Bryce from uh, O'Reilly Alpha Tech Ventures was like, I'm turning off my Angelist profile. This is bullshit, I'm taking my ball home and I'm going back to VC land. And it's like, really? Good call, Bryce, you know, like, now that's where all the deal flow's happening, all the money's being raised. You absolutely have to be on there. And really, I learned something really great from Naval, where he just said to me once over dinner, like, it's a race to see who can be the most helpful. Most alpha. Helpful. Helpful. And he said, my goal is to be the most helpful to startups. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting. That's what I've been trying to do, too. Like, what an interesting, like, 
you know, people coming upon the same sort of theme. And he's like, yeah. And so I was like, well, how are you going to make money? He's like, who cares? Like, I'm just going to figure out how to be the most helpful and then it will, it will happen, right? And so I think syndicates is the answer to that question. And maybe the job board will eventually be the answer. But syndicates is this wonderful thing where he's saying, well, you know, maybe you can't raise a fund, Jason. You're just an angel investor. It turns out I wound up raising a fund. But if I hadn't raised the fund, I now have $800,000 in people who want to invest after I invest, we're in parallel. Now, who knows how many of those eight those people will actually come in for each deal, how many people don't understand what they're signing up for. There's a lot of blocking and tackling that has to occur, like accreditation and whatnot. But in six months, we'll also have unaccredited investors in this ecosystem, you know, just civilians who instead of spending $500 on, you know, uh, beer or you know, roulette or poker can put $500 on Evernote in year one or LinkedIn. This is going to be a radical transformation. I think obviously people, you know, are adults. They should be allowed to do whatever they want with their money. Heck, I think kids should be able to do what they want with their money. Um, and so AngelList is going to change everything. And it's going to really, talking about winners and losers, if you're Kevin Rose or you're, you know, Dave Morin or you're um, Tim Ferriss, you're talking about people who had massive value to startups. Mm -hmm. Those individuals, everybody knows them by name, they have massive social media footprints, and if they invest in something, you're gonna get some major value add, like you know, Tim Ferriss sends his 10,000 true fans there, or Kevin Rose sends 10,000 true fans, or Kevin Rose introduces you to anybody since he knows anybody, or Dave Moore introduces you to Zuckerberg because he knows him, whatever it is. So then the angel investors who don't provide value, they're the Fisca Karmas, or the venture capital firm that nobody knows that has a respectable sized fund, but you know, they get the sort of secondary deal flow. Those people are the Fisca Karmas. They're gonna go to zero. Like they're gonna be just really screwed because they can't get into deals. And then the people who really provide massive value are gonna be disproportionately rewarded because now they have more money to put into deals and the entrepreneur is gonna be rewarded who get them. Because now, I looked at my thing a couple days ago, and there's 225 people or something, 250 people who've backed my syndicate. I usually put in 50 to 250 into a company. Now there's another $800,000 coming in. Well, that's a million dollars, and I've had a couple of entrepreneurs say to me, well, I would like you to be the lead. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not the lead. That's not what I do. They're like, you know, you set the price. I'm like, I don't want to set the price. Join the board. No, no, I don't want to join the board. You know, I'm invested in 47 companies right now. I, I can't possibly be on the board of your company and then say no to 46, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard. Um, so there's a lot of things that are going to change based on this. But you, one entrepreneur of a very high-profile startup right now that's doing very well said, um, I want those 250 people. And I said, well, why do you want them? He said, well, we have a high-end product, as you know. It's in the sort of, it's a product that people who are accredited investors would be able to purchase, mm -hmm. specifically targeted at them, in fact. And he said, well, I want those people to be investors, but I don't want to go to those 250 people one at a time and get their investment. So I just love the idea that 250 people who are millionaires would then be an investor in my company and be talking about it to their other millionaire friends who would buy a subscription to our service. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, this is going to be very interesting for people. Um, and, it, and it's not just going to be for like the whales, like Kevin or Dave or Tim or myself. There's going to be people in the long tail of it. So you might have somebody who has done particularly well, let's say, in um, enterprise software. And they've got 15 people backing them who've had success in enterprise. And now you've got like, let's say David Sachs did it, you know, from Yammer. He's done enterprise stuff. He's super smart. He did PayPal. And he says, I'm going to put 250 into each of my deals. And then all of a sudden, 20 of his friends back him on deals. He doesn't need the money. He could say zero carry. But now you've got David Sachs plus 20 interesting of people who are his friends. Wow, now you've got this great Koretsu coming and supporting your project. So I think it's more than just money. Um, it's more about the network. And I think it's going to lead to um, some individuals like Tim Ferriss, maybe, who wouldn't be able to do... Uh, who, who does angel investing but isn't necessarily like a big angel investor, sort of like maybe a $50,000 or $100,000 angel investor, becomes like the 250 to 500, excuse me, but eventually he's going to be competing with Sequoia and other people for, uh, or Excel or Benchmark, the top tier firms, to do A rounds. Now that's where it's going to be truly, there's no doubt it's going to impact Angel investing, absolutely going to impact it. There's no entrepreneur I've met who says, I don't want to do angelist. <coughs> but now, could it impact your A round? Mm. Now, that would be a fundamental titanic shift in power. And I love it. I think it's awesome. I think Naval deserves huge credit. Yep. 
And I think it's going to be great for entrepreneurs. New Relic, I love you. You guys are so great. Uh, powerful application performance. Uh, and it's a tool I use myself, right? I have to make sure that launch.co, the ticker, which is becoming a really powerful, awesome product, if I do say so myself, uh, thanks to Kristen and all hard work on it. Uh, and Jonas, who builds the software package. I need to make sure that Jonas is doing a good job, Kristen's doing a good job, that the service is up and running, and it's fast. And uh, I don't have time to be like in there monitoring every day. So I use, uh, my team is in there every day looking at New Relic, but I just get this great, beautiful email that tells me, hey, 98.3% uptime, now I can yell at somebody. 1.7% was down this week. And you, trust me, I'm going to go talk to somebody about this. Why were we down? I want to know the answer. And uh, New Relic provides this great application level, hardware level, transport level. The company's been growing like a weed. It is unbelievable. When they started as a sponsor and a partner for This Week in Startups, they only had like 20,000 clients. Now they're up to 50,000. Every time I get new ad copy, it's going up 10,000. Their clients and partners include Nike, Warby Parker, Airbnb, Comcast, and at and and of course me, Jason Calacanis, at launch. If you're not using it, I mean, come on. Get with the program. It's incredibly affordable. It's incredibly powerful. And speed and stability are two of the best weapons you have in your startup toolbox. New Relic. It's absolutely essential that you use New Relic. And uh, they actually now uh, support new. Uh, they they support uh, Node.js, right? Very popular uh, language uh, that they monitor. So you can actually see down to the down to the Node.js level how fast you're going. Not just your servers, not just the transport, just really sp every little aspect of performance that they are monitoring. It's just incredible product, and they keep adding more and more features. Newrelic.com/twist. Newrelic.com/twist. Newrelic.com/twist, and you will get one of these gorgeous free T-shirts. Yes, that's right. The New Relic team knows the value of the This Week in Startups audience. They know that you guys are amplifiers, that you actually use the products we talk about um, because we only talk about great products that we use, right? That's the way the advertising works on this show. I'm so lucky that all the products that we talk about are ones I actually use. We make a list of the products we use at our company. We go to them and say, Jason would like to read the ad on This Week in Startups. And you know what? Then we just get a couple of them to say yes, and we never have to read an ad for something that's crap. I read ads for products I love. What a great gig I have. And New Relic is a great product. Go to newrelic.com slash twist and get the This Week in Startups t-shirt that was made by a super fan. Uh, and you can only get it there. You don't need to put a credit card in. You just sign up and get deep and actionable data. Super fast, super easy, no credit card required. Newrelic.com slash twist. And everybody thank at New Relic. And it's a great company to work for. Listen, they're tearing it up up there. If you, if I was a developer or a salesperson, I would be up there trying to get a job at New Relic because they are making bank. That company's going to be worth a lot of money. Thank you, New Relic. Let's get back to the program. We're gonna, I'm going to open this up to questions for, from the audience if you guys have any. We have the, uh, the throwable mic. So... Uh but you have to catch it, right? If you drop yeah. it, you don't get to ask a question. That's right. That's right. So if you're not coordinated, you're not getting to answer a question. You just uh, put a, a, a thought piece in your launch ticker about Google, yeah. speaking of unlimited uh, shifts in power and uh, going for all the marbles all at once. Um, where, I mean, it sounded like the Forbin project, for those of you remember, where the, basically the computer takes over the world. Um, but it was plausible. So tell us where, where you, how you think this is changing the world for, for us who are trying to build companies. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think it speaks to ambition, right? And it speaks to the founder sticking with a project for a long time. So Google had this sort of 10-year period where people were like, well, it's a pretty good search engine, but sometimes it's not so good. And they launched Gmail, and that's kind of interesting. And they bought YouTube, but it was still like they're the search company. And now nobody looks at them as that. And that's really because Larry Page came in and said, the benchmark now is moonshots and 10x thinking. And when a founder is in the position he's in, which is playing for a legacy, right? Like he can't possibly have more money or can't possibly have more power or whatever might drive a person. And knowing Larry, I know that's not what drives him anyway. He's driven more by intellectual curiosity and solving problems. But when he sets a mandate for himself and his team that 10x is what the goal is and moonshots are the goal, and he gives people that kind of freedom, and they have a foundation of more data than anybody on the planet, essentially unlimited amounts of capital. They don't know how to spend their capital. They have so much money, they don't know how to put it all to work. Uh, certainly without, they don't know how to put it to work without triggering um, 
uh, antitrust. So they have this huge amounts of money. So they say, well, we can't go buy things because the government gets crazy. So let's just try building insane things. And then you get self-driving cars. Then you get Android. Then you get maybe they'll buy the rights to the NFL. I've understood from people on the inside that they're going to buy the NFL rights, at least digital. Then they'll buy the NBA. They make the Chromecast $35. They make an operating system Chromebook. And, but that's not enough. Let's make Android an operating <laughs> system too. Um, so unlimited data. Unlimited number of, they have more smart people than anybody, more data than anybody, more money than almost anybody with the exception of, say, Exxon or Apple, uh, and more ambition, certainly. And so machine learning, um, quantum computing, wearables, there's no end to their ambition. And so what that means is if they can, ec and life extension, if they can execute on just a small percentage of these moonshots, any one of these moonshots would make a company that would be similar in size to, you know, Yahoo or eBay or whatever. Well, they've got 20 of these going on that we know about. And if they have 20 that are going on that we know about, this is another 100 at they, work. Didn't they hire Regina Dugan? I'm not certain. Yeah. Regina Dugan was the uh, director of the NSA. Yeah. Uh, and so <laughs> they have, the, I think one of the things they're doing is... No, no, this, DARPA. Forgive yeah. me. DARPA. I think what they're doing is they're hiring every smart person they can uh, for two reasons. One, yeah. they might actually do yeah. something... Um, interesting at Google, yeah. and two, they're not on the market competing with Google. I know right. it sounds pretty sinister, but if you have unlimited money, and money is just like, oh, well, it's just a pile of rocks over there, well, let's just take all these smart people off the market, which is what they're doing, essentially, by hiring so many smart people. And so there are ramifications for this. I think Google's going to win an extraordinary amount. It's going to be the largest, most powerful company in the world, much bigger than Apple, much bigger than Microsoft. <clears throat> and if you look at the same time they're having this massive ambition, you have companies like Microsoft and Apple, which are managing existing product lines um, as they're you know, declining, right? So Apple, the most they can think of doing with their money is giving it back in a dividend or doing a share buyback. And Tim Cook's meeting with you know, Carl Icahn and they don't buy companies, generally speaking, the small little obscure things. And they don't wanna try to do any sort of big moonshots or 10X, it's all incremental. And, the big idea this year is we're going to come out with the 5C, which is $100 cheaper than the 5S, and it's got multiple colors, and like that's the big idea. And then Microsoft's big idea is the Surface Pro 2 is going to have two levels of kickstand. Like That was the marketing, and I'm like, okay, how do th these companies are an embarrassment compared to Google's ambition on an ambition level? I'm not saying the people are. I'm not saying the products are. But on a pure ambition level, we're talking about two wildly different sets of ambition. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that these other companies are not ambitious. It's to say that Google and Larry Page and Sergey Brin have a level of ambition that has never been seen before in the history of enterprise. There's nobody who's had this, I mean, even the robber barons, you know, in their age, you know, they were content to like own the railroads or own the railroads west of the Mississippi or I'm gonna own coal, you know, like they want, or I'm gonna own the newspapers. Like they wanted to own a thing, but they didn't think that they were gonna own life extension and fiber to every home, you know, and, and this sort of long list of things. Now, how does that impact entrepreneurs? Um, you know, I don't think you can let competition impact, uh, you know, get in the way of you building a great world-class product. You can, you can still move faster than Google. What it does mean is if Google decides they're going to go into your space, you know, they could just roll over you. You know, it, it's just the nature of very large companies. It also means you could outrun them. Right? I, I kind of look at um, startups as packs of raptors, you know, like yeah. there's a bunch of like, you know, his two little baby raptors, right? Okay, if they run into like the big huge dinosaur, they're going to get squashed. They really can't fight it. But if they survive long enough and then there's six or seven of them and they breed and then there's 12 of them and they get full grown, yeah, they're taking down a Tyrannosaurus <coughs> Rex, right? I mean, because Google was that little raptor group. It was. Um, now they're just a sort of big you know, Brontosaur, whatever, you know, they just step on people and crush them. Uh, but it's a, it's a wildly ambitious company, and it speaks to also the founder staying at a company. If Bill Gates had stayed at Microsoft, see, I think Bill Gates left Microsoft so he could do really ambitious things like cure malaria mm -hmm. or do Terra Power and do, like, new nuclear power. But if you think about it, what Larry Page is doing is he's staying at Google while doing massively ambitious things. So I think what should happen is Bill Gates should come back to Microsoft and just pull in what the Gates Foundation is doing and make that all for profit and like, okay, so why can't Microsoft work on nuclear power? Like, why not? There's a bunch of smart people there. They're all in buildings. People in, smart build people in buildings do smart things. They make products. They come <laughs> out the door. Like, who cares, 
right? Like if you can build software. So if Google can build a self-driving car, Microsoft can build a why not? nuclear power. Absolutely they could. I mean, it's just smart people in offices working together to collaborate to make products. It's no difference. I mean, Elon Musk, I think, is the driving force behind what Larry Page is doing. Hmm. Because I think when Elon Musk made Tesla happen and he made SpaceX happen, I think it sparked something in Larry that made him say like, well, Elon is going for 100 X's. He's going for Mars and he's going for, you know, uh, electric cars and solving that problem and Solar City and the Hyperloop. I think now we have this great era of competition in big, huge products that matter. And that's what I think entrepreneurs need to work on. Big, huge products that matter. Not another app, <coughs> but bigger problems. It could start as an app, but you have to have a bigger ambition. Have the vision. How about ambition. Having, how about having, and then vision. How about having the questions? Any okay, there? Great. And uh, by the way, these questions do not have to be about going to Mars. They can be small, tactical questions. Well, while you're thinking of that, <laughs> are there any out there I can't see? Come on. All right. Well, how about somebody's got a question. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Yep. Once the first person goes, everybody else will I start know. asking questions. Good catch. Oh, wow. On the rebound. My throw was. Hello? Hello? That's pretty cool. I've never used one of these. Um, so as Rafe said, we're here part of the Accelerator, and uh, w the tool we built is Pistachio. It's a publishing tool. Um, and arguably being you know, one of the godfathers in that space, uh, the question I have for you is, in your experience, what was the biggest hurdle um, that you found in getting people to adopt that type of thing? Like what, um, what was the consistency in the type of people that would be more, uh, more likely to want to publish? Um, great question. Um, you know, in the early stages of these kind of revolutions, a lot of times it's very tactical things. So like just a content management solution that actually worked, like there wasn't one. Movable type barely worked in the early days. Blogger was okay. You know, and then WordPress came out and that was pretty good and it was like, wow, okay, now this thing can start to grow and Drupal comes out and it's extensible and you see Huffington Post and Business Insider and other stuff start to scale. So there was you know, very tactical, technical issues in publishing. And making publishing tools free was what really made blogging possible. Because you have to remember, before that, the idea of putting a blog post up meant putting a server up, meant installing Vignette or some other publishing, or writing code, right? So there was a real revolution there, um, you know, in 2002, 2003, 2004, with free software to blog. Now, I think a lot of it has to do with um, people actually having something to say, being able to make a sustainable living, um, and just making it sustainable, right? So if you look at a, um, a lot of the tools that are coming out today, they're about sustainability, somebody being able to quit their day job, not just post something online, but be able to post something online for a living, right? So um, while it might be great that your tool can let people publish from Evernote to their blog, and that makes it more efficient and interesting, what really the higher end problems are going to start to be sustainability and can an individual then go make a living doing this, right? Um, and reach a big audience. And I think, you know, Medium is a really interesting project in that it's breaking down into its component parts um, what publishing is, right? Having an editor. So the editing system there is very sophisticated. I don't know if you've played with it. Um, and so that's a sort of fascinating thing. Um, and Core is a fascinating product in that it allows people um, to quickly find other people capable of adding to the knowledge through their currency and other tricks. So um, entrepreneurship a lot of times is about a wedge strategy, building a tool that like solves some problem. And then once you crack open the window and the door and you look inside, you say a world of possibilities, right? And that's what I hope for you guys is like, hey, we figured out that people live in Evernote and if they could hit the publish key and they could share with the world, they could, this could be really powerful. Okay, now that you got that cracked open and you see inside the hearts and minds of those individuals, what else do they need, right? And so this is one of the things I learned just from somebody who worked for me who was uh, really into listening labs, who's a UX uh, guy and he was young and he would just record conversations with people in our listening lab and then bring me the tapes and he would edit the tapes down and just sitting there and listening to customers talk you know and, and use your product terrifying and enlightening like okay this person is now using your product and they're like I don't know how how do I hit submit I mean how do I and there's like a huge button submit and there's a big red arrow flashing on the side saying click the submit button they're like what do I do now 
and you're like, oh my God, people are stupid or whatever, you know? It's, but it's so humbling to watch people actually use your product. But then if you can get them talking and figure out what they want next, and this is a really, a thing that a lot of entrepreneurs don't do, which is they don't talk to their customers where they make products in an abstraction, like I'm making a publishing tool. I, I see there's like Evernote is not connected to WordPress or Tumblr. What if it was? Wow, congratulations, you found that hook. That sounds like a great behavioral device. Now what, right? And how are people using it? And what are they getting out of it? Oh, now you find out that it's group of, a group of people in a company who are publishing and editing together, and now they're putting their press releases out. Okay, wow, now we've got some discovery or proof point. It's like workflow, whatever it is. And just following that string and to where it takes you. But what I find is people make a product and like, what's the next feature? No, no, not what's the next feature. Talk to the customers. Constantly be talking to the customers is so critical. And I think that's where you'll find your next answer. You don't have to have the answer now. That's the beautiful thing about entrepreneurship and finding a behavioral hook, something that just people get addicted to and you just know they love it. Then what's next? Thank you. My pleasure. It's kind of more fun when you throw the box at somebody, There's isn't like it? <laughs> Okay, hey, um, I'm going to take you back to the um, kind of investment uh, arena, and um, so totally agree that you know AngelList is going to be uh, potentially disruptive. Um, if you go on AngelList today, you'll see that I believe there's 1,200 accelerators that are listed globally, right? So one might say this is kind of there's an accelerator palooza happening in the world. Uh, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on their role, their evolution, the value that they might you know add or not add. Et cetera. Yeah, I mean, if somebody told me I could get 6% of a company for $14,000 in 10 weeks, I would think that's a pretty amazing deal. Um, so I think that it's a pretty amazing deal for the people running them. I don't know if it's a great deal for the entrepreneurs in every case. Um, so without singling out any of these accelerators, I do think looking at the track records of who's running them and are they successful and are they providing true value, um, so I, I find a lot of successful entrepreneurs who could raise their A round or, or you know, easily their angel round, sometimes their A round, and like, I'm thinking about going in an accelerator. I'm like, why? And there's, it seems to like a vanity PR kind of play, and I think that's kind of dopey, to be honest, because you're giving away 6% of your company or 10% of your company, and the person who, on the other end has got, you know, 40 or 50 people in that accelerator. It's kind of like a big, huge scam in, in some cases. Like I give you, you give me 10 weeks of your time, an hour a week, and then I give you, this. it doesn't seem like a fair trade of services. Now, if you're coming out of school and you've never run a company, then that is totally fair, right? So if you have a non-successful product, you have a, you know, a little mock-up um, and you're learning, great. So if you compare it to college, in college you pay and you get nothing. And in, generally speaking, like if, if you know, I mean, it's a pretty good party for four years or whatever, but generally speaking, people do not come out of college today with much from most colleges. In fact, two thirds of people coming out of college don't even use the degree in the field that they work in eventually. Um, so there's a huge problem there. But if you look at it as I get paid to learn, well then of course it's the, most, it's the greatest thing in the world. So I see no downside to them. And I think it's fantastic. I hope there's 10,000 of them, 100,000 of them, and we call them college in the future, right? Like that would be a better version of college. Um, but I think it's something to definitely think deeply about as entrepreneurs if you're getting true value from them. And if the person running it, like if it's Paul Graham or David Cohen, like those guys might be worth 50% of your company. Like, holy cow, they provide massive value. But, you know, going down that long tail, I'm not so certain. Like Evernote, clearly this has value. Like you get into the company, you get into the product, worst case scenario, you come work here and get all this free fucking food and they give you free keyboards and a machine. I don't know how that works. But does anybody, here, anybody have their ID with them? Because I need a lightning charger and that's pretty awesome. Um, so I, I think it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And back to Rafe's question earlier, which is like it's so much cheaper now. I feel like what we're doing is in the search for life in the universe, you know, satellites used to cost $10 million. So we want to send a satellite out, it costs $10 million. Now they cost $16,000. It's called Y Combinator or Techstars, right? Well, if sending satellites were that cheap, we would have found ET by now. Like, we would have found the rebels if we could send out a million of these satellites this far. And I think that's why you're seeing entrepreneurship and innovation is accelerating because people are trying so many different things. Like, 
I was deriding the Pinterest copier before, earlier, but the truth is, you know, the, even the person copying Pinterest is trying something. You know, they have something that is a possibility that they land on that, you know, second moon of Endor and find the Ewoks. Like, you might find water. You might find life. And so it's a wonderful time that many people are trying many different things. And who cares what the failure rate? The failure rate is 7 out of 10. Let's say I'm correct in that number, and it's arguably plus or minus one or two. That means you have seven waste $25,000, which is $175,000. You have two return back the $25,000, so now you've only lost one twenty-five, and then you have the one go 1,000x. Oh my God, you're way in the black. Um, so this is just a wonderful time for people to be trying a lot of stuff. And then in terms of angel investing, you have to invest in 30, 40, 50 companies if you want to have a chance of a return. And so for me, you know, I've done 40 companies, 50 companies, I'll do another 50 over the next three or four years with the fund put me at 100, and I've already got Uber and a couple of other really great ones, Signpost and Thumbtack and a bunch of other awesome chart beat. That, you know, I've been lucky enough to be involved with Boxby and Madstage and just all brilliant.org, all these great companies that went through the launch festival. And so it's going to be such an extraordinary future. This boom is so sustainable. It's such a sustainable boom right now because there are trillions of dollars in bonds and, you know, real estate and other boring places and rich people just don't know where to put their money and if we can keep creating amazing companies you'll keep having this money from the sidelines say oh yeah you were involved in pinterest or linkedin that worked out let's try to find the next one let's try to find the next one so really if you just get any kind of consumer traction right now or revenue traction there'll be an unlimited supply of money so people just need to be more bold now I, that's the thing i'm i'm having a problem with entrepreneurs is they, are very, they can very easily describe how their business gets to $5 million in revenue or $10 million in revenue, but they, they can't explain how it gets to 50 or $100 million in revenue. And that sort of kills it on an angel investing basis. Well, if the best you can think of is a $10 million revenue company, then it's only worth $50 million, then wow, we lose that outlier of an Uber or an outlier of a Pinterest or an outlier of an Airbnb or Dropbox or whatever, Yammer. So that's one of the tips for entrepreneurs and something, frankly, I've gotten I've really focused on getting better about in my career is setting the goalposts really far down the field and having a billion dollar vision while executing every day, you know, one step in front of, one foot in front of the other, very slowly, methodically executing, but at least saying, listen, I have a path that inside.com makes a billion dollars a year. Like when I launch it in December and you all see it, you go, yep, I can see that being a billion dollar company. I can see that being one of the top 10 sites on the internet very easily, one of the top 10 apps in the app store. It'll be very easy for people to conceive of that. That doesn't mean that I'm gonna get there. That means my team and I are gonna to have to struggle every day to, you know, again, back to the age of excellence, we we'll have to struggle every day to get there, but at least it's a clear path. Like, it's possible to get there. So speaking of which, what is Inside? That's your, that's your next thing? What can you what tell us? What is Inside? It's a great domain name. How much did it, co how much did it cost you? I got Inside.com for 60 grand, uh, true story. And it's a multi-million dollar domain, obviously. From the watermelon guys? No, I got it actually. No, you, you guys do know that the original domain name sellers started with a watermelon farm. I forgot the name. Yeah, of no, company. it wasn't a watermelon yeah. farm. Okay. It, was, it had passed hands three or four times. And you remember yeah. it was a trade publication in the 90s. Oh, that's that right. failed miserably after 18 <laughs> months, but it was a pretty cool product. So, yeah, I was able to get it at a steal. The, the interesting thing was the person who had the inside Twitter handle emailed me and was like, hey, I think it's worth double the domain name, so yeah. I like $100,000 yeah. for the Twitter handle. And I was like, you do. Well, interestingly, I was talking to my friends over at Twitter, and as you know, you're not allowed to sell Twitter handles. So um, now that I have this email from you yeah. saying you wanted to sell it, I think we should probably change the discussion to a consulting agreement <laughs> in which I pay you $1,000 to consult with me on how I might best use the Twitter <laughs> handle at inside.com and I will take you to Nobu when I'm in London. <laughs> Interesting, the individual agreed. He was also happened to be a fan of the show, but I was like, I'm not giving you $100,000 for the Twitter handle inside. No back and forth. There was two back and forths. All right. $100,000, $500, and $1,000 plus Nobu, which is $1,500. I mean, it's gonna be $500 Nobu in London. I'm gonna have to make do on that in the next year. You poor thing. I think branding is just critically important. Yeah. You know, I think you, when, and it, you can fake it till you make it. You know, you can have like, <coughs> you know, inside.de, you know. Is that spelled right? I inside. 
Yeah, like you can, you can do like that kind of nonsense, you know, is good, whatever, dot is, or whatever, good dot is, um, or del dot ious dot us. Like you can, you can do that kind of stuff fine, but just give your company a good name. You know, it's like a real big tell if you don't have a good brand name. Critical. One or two more out there? I saw somebody take the mic, yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, curious. We often think about entrepreneurship as new products, new technology, a solution to, to the, the big problem that the world's trying to solve. But oftentimes we trip up when it comes time to bring our products to market. Can you speak a little bit about marketing sales, timing of bringing them into ventures that you've been involved in, and uh, how to engage in, uh, in that activity? Ooh, that's a big, so you're basically saying like you've made a product, how do you market it and get it out into the world? Um, yeah, I mean, it, te it's, it really depends on the product. Um, some products, you know, have built in virality, um, like PayPal did, you know, in order every time you send money to somebody, they have to sign up to get it, right? Like that's like the height of, you know, high end marketing. Um, and yeah, there, social is obviously becoming, you know, a huge driving force. If you look at just the news business, the news business went from like eHow and Mahalo and, you know, create like how to make apple pie and you run, you know, you know, you come up at the top of Google. Now Google's moved all the search results down. So really you have to make like 10 things about apple pie you won't believe with kittens and boobies and then tweet it. And it's, if it's not tweetable and social, then it doesn't work, right? So all journalism is moving to BuzzFeed-ish listicle nonsense. Um, and so my point with that is, is growth, which is a sort of overarching way I look at um, marketing, is typically you know, a couple of dozen different things that change in importance based on the time of your company and what's going on in the world. And your, your, the real benefit is when you can come upon something before everybody else does because marketing quickly becomes commoditized. Once people learned that the listicle and the slideshow drove stuff, people did it. Once people learned that starting a fight on Twitter worked, you know, after Dave Weiner and I perfected it, <laughs> and Mike Arrington and I perfected it, now everybody wants to start a fight, you know, and that, oh, a Twitter war is the way to, you know, get traffic or recognition for your blog, right? But you can't just take whatever worked previously because it all becomes commoditized and then diffused. So you have to have dedicated people in your company called growth people, and all they do is hold themselves in the organization um, to a high standard of marketing and, you know, and everything that involves um, and track it and measure it. And in the old days, you didn't really do this too much. You'd be like, okay, well, we have a budget of $10 million, so we're going to put 3% of that, $300,000 towards marketing, and you'd hire somebody and you'd give it to them, and they'd give 100 to PR and 100 to magazines and 100 to radio, whatever it is, and you wish for the best. It's much different now, you know, and I think you, you have to really think about it strategically and have people dedicated to it, trying a lot of different things, innovating, um, and you, you should have at least 10 or 20 percent of your staff focused just on growth. That's the thing that's changed. And the companies I see that are winning, they have a growth team. Some people call it a growth hacker. I just I have two people in my company right now who are responsible for growth. The most important piece of growth is measuring if you're growing or not and then trying to figure out why. And I see startup after startup, ones I'm invested in or ones I'm talking about investing in, they don't know yet because they don't have the resources to have the growth person. I think your fifth, sixth person in a company should be the growth person. Mm. Like literally, if you get to 10 people and you don't have a growth person yet, you're doing it wrong. So fire, everybody go home tonight, fire your weakest team member and or, uh, <laughs> dead serious, like sometimes you gotta upgrade, or just tell somebody like, listen, you need to be the growth person. That's it. You know, I know you're doing operations. I know you do sales. You're in charge of growth. And make a list of the 50 different things you can do and just pound that list. Pound that list. Great. Thanks. One more. Yep. Oh. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by and sharing your insight. Greatly appreciated. Um, so my question is about feedback. Um, you know, when you're building something new and exciting, everyone has their two cents of what you should be fixing. But aside from the typical, oh, look at trends and what type of feedback, um, if you could offer your perspective or on how to just really sift through it and get deeper um, and really utilize feedback. Yeah, that's, um, what's your name? Bianca. Bianca, that's a fantastic question. That might be the question of the night. Um, 
especially because of accelerators and social media and everything, everybody wants to give you their opinion. And great product is not made by consensus. Um, it's made by, you know, vision and passion and, you know, an entrepreneur and sometimes statistics and, you know, studying people. And so what I see happen a lot of times in accelerators is, you know, somebody comes in and, okay, I've had my success in the consumer internet. So I look at your company and I'm like, well, this has to be more consumer. And then the next person comes in and it's David Sachs and he does entrepreneur, he does enterprise and, oh, this needs to be enterprise, you know, and everybody like looks at it through their lenses and the entrepreneur is like head spinning from all this advice. So you take all the smart information in and you have to understand a couple things. One is you have to build the service that you want to build at the end of the day. The service, the product that you want to see manifest itself in the world for a very deep and personal reason. When you see inside.com, you'll look at it and say, that's the product Jason was meant to build. That's a product Jason could work on for 20 years. He did Silicon Art Report, he did Weblogs Inc., he did Launch, he did TechCrunch 50, he does his podcast, that makes total sense. It'll just click for you like, yes. And so I think you have to look in your heart and look at the problem that you want to see solved in the world and the product you want to use and make that. What that means is a lot of times, people will come to you and that's not the product they want to see in the world and so they'll try to tell you that they don't want it. Additionally, most people are stupid and or not savvy about building product. So, you know, if, if, if Martin Scorsese or Steven Spielberg start asking people about what they want in a film, it's probably the opposite of what they would make, right? And those directors, those artists would never ask their audience what they should make. They make Star Wars or Raiders of the Lost Ark or Akira Kasara makes High and Low and Seven Samurai based on what he or she in their hearts want to see exist in the world and they believe deserves to be out there and will change everything. So yeah, sure you take the feedback and some of it on a tactical basis could be true, right? Oh wow, the microphones suck or this is bad, but make the product you want to make. When I started This Week in Startups, people told me it's too long. Make it short, ask one question. And you know what, it's like, that's not the show I want to do. I want to have a long discussion. I want it, and I want the discussion to go on as long as it's interesting. And if that means the Chris Sock episode is two and a half hours, and I split it into two, well, fuck you if you don't like it. Because that's the show I want to do. <coughs> and you know what? That's the show people say is the best show ever in the history of the show. And so what, but if I asked them, do you want a two and a half hour show with an angel investor guy who worked at Google in like a policy kind of position who wears cowboy shirts, you'd be like, no. Uh, but it turns out it is a great show, right? And so you got to follow your heart, be able to determine if what people are telling you is tactical or just their lack of vision, because they're not as close to the problem too, right? You might be super close to the problem and have studied it for a year. And then somebody comes in like me and I'm like, oh yeah, I don't think so, you know, and ah, I did that, you know, and it's like, well, ignore it. I love when an entrepreneur tells me, you know what, Jason, you're wrong. I love that conversation. I am? Great. Educate me. Explain to me why I'm wrong. I would love to get smarter, right? And a lot of these VCs that I've pitched over the years, this is why I've tried to be a better angel investor, tried to be a better partner for startups and entrepreneurs, because a lot of times I would meet with VCs and they'd say, Jason, you don't know what you're talking about. This is what, how the world is. And I'd be like, I, I actually don't think that's how the world is. I, I don't think you need editors. I think blogs are about not having editors. And no, no, you need to have this. You need to have that. You're doing it wrong. And thank God I didn't listen to them. But boy, would they be jerks about it, like just make you feel bad about it and just pound. you know. And then I would go to board meetings sometimes when I started getting asked to be on boards. And people would be like, well, I went home. And you know, this VC is like, I went home and I showed it to my wife and my wife. And you know, she didn't like it. Or whatever, and then I'm like, are we really in a board meeting with a multi tens of millions of dollar a year old, 50 year old guy who lives in Malibu or something talking about his wife's opinion on a product that has nothing, like what are we doing here? Like let the entrepreneur do their job and ask them how to support it. Don't send them on wild goose chases, right? And so I think that can happen. So consider the source, consider what's in your heart. Um, and, and listen, most of all, to the customers, right? The customers are going to give you the ultimate feedback. And I'll give you a, just one closing example. When in, in the early days of the launch conference, or back when it was TechCrunch 40, um, a company named Zendesk pitched me. And the guy was really smart, and I was talking to him, and he was from, I don't know, Sweden or somewhere, and Denmark, I can't remember, some Scandinavian country. And I was like, listen, I was an IT guy. And I've used help desk software. This software 
sucks. It's got none of the features. It's on the web, so somebody could hack it. And this is in 2005 or something, 2006. And he's like, well, Jason, no, I, I don't think you're out of sales. Like, wait, 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 wait. Let me tell you what I know. And he's like, no, no, but Jason, the fact that it's simpler means that people who didn't use help desk software at all before and are using Excel spreadsheets and Microsoft Word to track calls will use it. And the fact that it's on the web and you don't have to install it on a server means a, a small company can have it with under 500 people or under 200 people. And we don't need to make as much money because we can make it off of a smaller amount of a larger group of people. And I apologize to the entrepreneur two years later because I didn't let them into TechCrunch 50. And I told him, I was like, this is too simple. You're going to get savaged by the judges. But he was at the forefront of the software as a service model and simplicity and pay per seat and so many things. I apologize a thousand times over to, I believe it's Mikkel from Zendesk. And I have, or just, I didn't get it. I did not see it. And I apologize. And thank God you didn't take anything I said seriously. <laughs> And that's a good lesson for everybody, is that nobody knows what's going to work until you try it. And entrepreneurship is about being in the game, which is what I said earlier about why do you keep doing it? I want to be in the game. Put me in the game, coach. Give me the ball. Let me shoot. Please put me in the game. And if you're in the game, you will figure it out. Thank you, Jason. That's it.